so with that, let me uh, quickly turn over now to uh, 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 Purnamita Gupta to talk about an important issue that was flagged by Jai Raman earlier, which is the whole aspect of climate finance. Um, so over to you, Purnamita. Thank you, Anand, and a very good afternoon to everyone here. Um, I'm going to try, should I share the presentation? Yes, uh, do you want me to do it? Um, I, I can do that if it's all right or. Can you can you see it? Yes, 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 this is fine. OK. Um, so I will jump straight into the topic that I want to share some thoughts on about that is climate finance for adaptation and mitigation mostly while bringing in nitty nearly willy some kind some sort of aspects on policy and governance, many of which tend to get interlinked. So to set the context. It would be appropriate to actually acknowledge what. Some key ideas that the AR6 acknowledges in the finance domain. One such being that broadening the equitable access to both domestic and international finance can act as a catalyst for accelerating mitigation and shifting development pathways. The second one being that, and this is where it gets more actionable, is to recognize that there is no one instrument of which can help in achieving the kinds of uh, ambition in reducing greenhouse gas emissions that the globe wishes to see. That that effective policy packages recognize the diversity of instruments which would be required and that these instruments do get tailored to national circumstances along with a host of other things. So given that these are some key statements that really speak to the developing country perspectives. If we hone in on the finance aspect, there are two dimensions that I thought would be good to flag. One is there is a concern about the total pool of available resources, and this has to be flagged as a part of the inclusive process of documenting science on international finance. It is as important as the second aspect of sharing of the available resources. Sometimes we see one versus the other being mentioned. Sometimes the two go hand in hand. But for the developing world as a whole, it is good to see science constantly endeavoring to put the two together because that is what will work. Which brings to the linked issue. Of. How do we anchor this finance discussion? And here. It is. Important to recognize. And never forget the basic and agreed principles of equity. Now. These have already been spoken about, but sometimes it is it was felt strongly. That this anchoring was lost and attempts to bring in that anchoring. Needed. A fairly engaged discussions. And this is not something which is beyond the realm of science, but very much within the realm of a science which is which hopes to become actionable, deliverable and fair. And there is a lot of policy science around this 
and implementation science as well. So these are two kinds of issues that I would like to flag as coming into prominence through this AR6 uh, process that we, some of us engaged with from my perspective personally. Coming specifically to finance things, what matters? What matters for raising the ambition level is something that I think is an underlying thread. And I would like to specifically focus on some of the things which I think were flagged by developing countries, often with India's leadership. Uh, so one of them was the role of public finance for adaptation to be repeatedly highlighted and acknowledged, not to be taken for granted, not to be missed out on. The second was the strengthening of text and citations on mobilization and access. Now there's a wealth of underlying material in the, in the chapters of the main reports, but the crux is to, you know, upfront it, bringing it up, and put it in a way that really works for developing countries. There's also the concern about the strong acknowledgement of the insufficiency of adaptation finance in particular. And we do see uh, some of this text in, in, in the SPN. <clears throat> It was also very important to emphasize and uphold the distinction between investments or aligned investments as they've sometimes been referred to earlier and finance to retain maximum flexibility and diversity of implications in different contexts when we are discussing these terms do not become synonyms. Bringing clarity through numbers has to be done with open mindedness. This again was, I think, an underlying principle on which I am sure we had very engaging and positive discussions with authors in many instances, and we all appreciate that, I think. That text to recognize promises made on climate finance Text to acknowledge that there are discrepancies in existing estimates from sometimes from very reputed agencies on climate finance flows. Text on the totality on adaptation finance being low. Can either be dealt with in two ways. One is if there is sufficiency of space to bring it all in. If not, the default at a minimum is not to upfront or selectively upfront one set of numbers. I, I would also like to give some specific examples of what I mean here uh, without taking up too much time. So, for instance, in the case of the 100 billion USD goal, to actively retain it in the SPM. To actively see that finance is not being replaced by investment, where finance can capture the context much better. The importance of public finance for mitigation. There is science on this, and it needs to be upheld as much as public finance for adaptation. And to illustrate, the case for strengthening text where there is a dispute about some numbers was the non-inclusion of the OECD estimate, which said that 79 billion US dollars is being met as a target. This is not to question the estimate, but to recognize that there are a myriad of estimates out there and perhaps it is not always possible for all of us to get into the details of debating on which is the most appropriate one. <clears throat> and essentially, there are very many assumptions that often go into 
arriving at these numbers. <clears throat> so I would like to highlight another idea that comes out as we look at the totality of the finance and governance picture on adaptation and mitigation. And this comes out of section B.3.2 as it stands that in the near term, 2021 to 2040, the projected level of risk depends more strongly on concurrent near term trends in vulnerability, exposure, and note the level of socioeconomic development and adaptation than on differences in climate hazards between emission scenarios. Now, there's a wealth of meaning behind this sentence, which obviously I do not have time to go into, but I can make some interpretations overall or from the uh, discussions on adaptation finance and mitigation finance. That is, that sustainable development and climate resilience are complementary. Now, whether this gets upfronted and clearly mentioned is a matter of, um, you know, the context, specific instances, and so on. But the idea that I think the philosophy that was pushed was that science needs to be able to bring these together effectively in reducing trade-offs and enhancing the synergies across these two. And here I want to give an example where uh, economic costs, benefits, examples from developing countries are really, truly less in number. There is a gap in science, but that does not mean that the developing country perspective does not feature. So if I can digress for a minute and wear my professor hat, then I would say in welfare economics, we say that where you have less, you give more weightage to those situations. If you have one or two or three publications versus 10 from the developed world, if you have one or two or three from the developing world, it is a question to debate. Do you, how much importance do you give? How much weightage do you give? The second idea is that criteria and distributive principles for meeting finance and investment are required to support desired transformation. If this is acknowledged in one way or the other, the anchoring in terms of distributive established distributive principles has to feature when talking about finance. <clears throat> the third aspect to highlight is the issue of cost effectiveness. Now, cost effectiveness again has been discussed in various underlying chapters. Bringing it together in the context of the way finance and investment flows are governed would mean to make it clear that for developing countries, cost effectiveness is in terms of the quality of life. And actively pursuing climate resilience in whichever sector, infrastructure, ecosystem-based adaptation, renewable energy, afforestation, social sector goals, would mean not to dissociate the two, sustainable development and climate resilience, but science as its best in the IPCC has to take up this challenge of pooling knowledge across these two and keep the focus on climate finance so that it motivates and incentivizes the kind of uh, emission reductions and adaptation that we hope to see. Uh, there is a lot of discussion around leveraging private finance, ESG push for companies, loss and damage, but several times these needed to have that little push to come into the, the SPM and to chart the way forward. Thank you very much. I will stop there. Thanks very much, Thanks, Purnamita, and really appreciate I think some uh, extraordinary efforts at bringing in and ensuring that developing country perspectives
remain on the table and at the forefront, as you said, in the construction of the uh, of the SPM. I think, as you noted, the whole question of climate finance is uh, is complex, uh, including what is climate finance and what gets counted and what doesn't get counted. Uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of this is not uh, voluntary, but really as part of convention obligations uh, rather than as uh, ODA. Uh, the other uh, aspect, which I think, as you, you also touched upon, is not just the mobilization, but also ultimately the delivery. Because as we have seen, the track record in terms of getting money to where it needs to be has been, of course, less than stellar. Uh, 